thank you very much. Very pleased to be here with you. I, I'm speaking to you not as an Arctic scientist, uh, but more as a scientist who happened to have uh, his research base in Cambridge for many years, and so I was right next door to the Scott Polar Research Institute and, of course, the British Antarctic Survey, not very far away, which both of them had a very significant impact on my interest in what is happening to the global climate. Now, what I'm really going to do is just run very quickly through the physic ba physical basis of Arctic change, and at the end of it, I'll just mention why what is happening in the Arctic, in the Arctic is so critically important. So, first of all, just to stress, global warming is happening. Uh, the temperature planet-wise is rising. This just shows over, uh, average global temperatures from uh, 1880 up to the present time. And you can draw whatever line you want to in through that data. This uh, straight line is just drawn to indicate that actually when you look uh, on average over the behavior uh, since uh, about 1950, this looks as if it's fairly closely resembling a straight line with all of the bumps and starts representing the weather change and the overall uh, dimension of change underneath that is the global warming that's happening. Of course, what we do know from the Arctic scientific studies is that the Arctic is warming faster than the rest of the planet on average. And so the uh, uh, left-hand figure shows the change between October-January average near-surface air temperatures for two different periods, the years 2009 to 2014, relative to the final 20 years of the 20th century, 1981 to 2000. So taking a recent period, comparing with 20 years over the past, we see that the Arctic region is warming significantly faster than the rest of the planet. And then if we look at the, the right-hand graph, we're simply comparing the temperature trend over the period 2000 to 2009. So quite clearly that trend continues into the present century. And that in itself requires a physical explanation. I'm going to disappoint myself and you by not trying to attempt the physical explanation behind this. There are many different reasons why this is happening. But in addition to worrying about the overall temperature, of course we need to look at the loss of ice. And first of all, looking at the ice based on land, then of course it's the Greenland ice sheet that is uh, the single most important and for planetary behavior, critically important. And what we see in the left-hand diagram is a clear indication that the volume changes of ice on Greenland 2011 to 2014 show that all coastal regions, virtually all coastal regions, are now experiencing a loss of mass. And we can again discuss the physical mo method of this happening, the carving process, loss of great big chunks of ice that float away as icebergs rather than the gentle slow melting that you see when you take an ice cube out of the refrigerator and put it on a saucer. Now actually just to make an important point, one method of, of ice loss is now beginning to indicate a really disturbing trend which is the formation of lakes uh, on, on the very top of the uh, ice shelf. And those lakes, of course, tend to have a blue color, and that means that the albedo is rather higher than the ice that would have been there. It's absorbing more solar heat, and that is a positive feedback in terms of the of ice. So looking at the potential positive feedbacks, this is the one that has been perhaps most uh, recently uh, given a fair bit of publicity. I'll come back later to why it's important that we understand the rate of loss of ice from Greenland, but if we uh, uh, just look at the rate of loss of the Greenland ice sheet uh, um, and how it's increasing, the right-hand curve just shows the five yearly mass loss rates for the ice sheets uh, over the whole period of having satellites up there to, to measure the, the rate of loss. 
Now, the second bit of ice that we need to look at is the, uh, is the sea ice. Uh, and here, of course, everyone in this room, I'm sure, is aware of the fact that the satellite records have shown how very clearly we are losing sea ice at, uh, at quite a large rate. And there are two kinds of observations that add together here. One is the total volume of ice, and the other is the sea ice extent. And quite clearly, just these photographs from satellites just show us the extent, and we see the uh, uh, loss of sea ice extent between 1984 and 2012 in the top left-hand pictures here. But prior to that, submarine records, and these records go back to some of that work from the Scott Polar Research Institute that I mentioned, uh, those uh, submarine records had previously shown that the thickness of the sea ice was, uh, was diminishing uh, uh, even in the period before the satellite data was coming forward. So what we see is that, uh, and the top right hand figure is showing this, the records are showing a loss of around 50% in the area of summer sea ice since the late 1970s, but the volume of sea ice is falling as well. So the thickness of the remaining ice is considerably smaller than the overall sheet that was there before. Let me just quickly mention that the, this means that the ocean that is exposed to sunlight, particularly during the summer months, of course, is larger in extent, and so we're going to get uh, a, a change in the albedo. We're absorbing solar energy more effectively in this region, which must be one of the contributing factors to the Arctic seeing a higher average temperature rise than the rest of the planet on average. Now, all of this to me adds up to this figure, which uh, uh, has emerged from a fairly recent publication, which is just the long-term commitment to sea level rise, rise overall. And uh, what we see here is a part as a function of the temperature increase planet-wise, average temperature increase, as a function of sea level. And this has no time in it. So this is looking at equilibrated systems, allowing systems to reach their equilibrium at each uh, uh, data point. It's not how the real world works. But the main point is to see that as the temperature rise gets to about one and a half degrees centigrade, this curve undergoes something of a discontinuity. And that is largely driven by the loss of Greenland ice sheet. Um, and so the overall sea level rise indicated here is, of course, in human terms, frightening. It, it uh, indicates a sea level rise in the region of 10 meters uh, once the temperature rises about one and a half degrees centigrade, and let me stress, above today's temperature on average. Now that in itself indicates that if we do care about the future of our civilization, we need to care about the, what the Arctic is telling us about the rate of loss of ice from land masses. Now of course this is summing up all the impacts uh, that uh, produce a rise in sea level. What is the total period of time that is indicated here? Well, the scientific community has ducked the question of time to date. The timeline that we're looking at could be 200 years to achieve these uh, numbers, and it could be 2,000 years. So we're not uh, indicating here a time period. But we either 200 or 2,000 years in human terms and human history is a relatively short period of time. Now, in the face of all of these challenges, um, what I've run within the Foreign Office is a detailed analysis of a risk assessment associated with climate change. And this is very different from the IPCC reports. This is published on a website. Um, it was published in uh, uh, June, in late June. What we were looking at was a risk assessment from the point of view of uh, a 
an insurance or a reinsurance agent, you don't insure your house against fire burning down because you think it's going to happen. You, you insure it because it might happen and you don't want to face the consequences. And what we did in this assessment was not say what is the average impact from climate change ahead of us, but we asked what is it the worst that climate change could throw at us, and then we analyzed the probability of that happening as if we were an insurance agent putting out an insurance policy at a given price. Right, so uh, I, I have no time to go through this in any detail, but let me just say one of the questions was rising sea levels, meaning that various coastal cities become dysfunctional. Uh, and we had working with us 120 experts drawn from the United States, India, China, and Britain. Now, very quickly, <coughs> if we just take three cities, uh, New York, Shanghai, Calcutta, within that grouping of experts, uh, and analyze what is the, oh, uh, at the bottom there we've got sea level rise in meters. Uh, what, what is the uh, number of events per 100 years, flooding events, that would make s living in those cities extremely difficult and cause a large number of fatalities if people were staying there. And we see that uh, the, the sort of one in a 100 year event, which is quite frequent, uh, really takes off by the time we get to a 0.4 meter sea level rise, but by the time we get to 0 0.8, 0 0.91 meter sea level rise, this curve is taking off to absurd proportions. In other words, if we look at Calcutta going underwater 900 times every 100 years, you can see that the city has become dysfunctional well before we get into that sort of uh, period. So, in other words, what this is setting out and we did this for a whole range of events like this, is survivability of these cities is very much at risk as sea level rises go above 0 0.3, 0 0.4 meters. And let me stress again, as Chief Scientific Advisor to the British Government, for me, a one in a 500 year, one in a thousand year event was the sort of level that we would hope to achieve. And looking at a one in a hundred year event is already far too dangerous to accept something of that order of magnitude. So, what I guess I'm just concluding with is Arctic science needs to be carefully nurtured as we go forward in time because the value of understanding what is happening to our ice sheets to the whole planet is absolutely critical. Thank you. Uh, hello, Gail Whiteman from the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. I'm also involved in the ISARC project. I'd like to ask the panelists more about the global economic impacts of a changing Arctic. And I'm wondering, how do we get uh, the boardroom, the corporate boardroom, say in the agricultural sector or the insurance sector, to pay more attention to what's going on in terms of Arctic change? Thank you. Where we often fail in the in environment, climate movement, um, is we quite often talk at our audiences in our own language and in our own time frames. And I think we, you have to understand if you're interested in climate and environmental issues, you're weird. Because quite frankly, 99.9% .9 of people barely care about, you know, the next 6 or 12 months, 18 months if you're lucky. The, the tragedy of the horizons that uh, Mark Carney, the governor of the Bank of England, coined it. Mm -hmm. So you have to work out how do I translate this issue into the language of my audience in a way that tells them they've got a problem, a risk now, not something in a year or two years or three years, but something they have to worry about now. I used to, when I was two years ago, I before I joined Carbon Tracker, I was a partner in the global law firm Norton Rose Fulbright. And just to get my fellow partners there to be interested, I, I had to kind of frame these issues in something that was relevant to their billable um, hour targets and the amount of money they made in, in this current business year. Even if I started talking about the following business year, they lost interest very quickly. So it's, you know, and I think the Carbon Track has been successful in that context. So I don't know if that, that's, you know, partly answers your question. So, David? My, my own uh, approach to this is very simple. Uh, we, the planet's 
people are fighting for our lives and the lives of the future for our children and grandchildren. We are literally doing that. But that doesn't sell very well. And so my second line of attack is the energy industry across the world is the world's single biggest industry, four to six trillion dollars a year. And we're going to see this industry change from a fossil fuel based industry to a fossil fuel free industry within a few decades. It's already happening, I tell them. 2014 investment in primary energy sources, just more than 50% was renewable energy for the whole planet. It's already beginning to happen. And if you want to get into these big markets where science, innovation, and wealth creation lies ahead of you, go for it.